if you ever doubted what's possible together, if you, if you ever questioned your faith in a better future, and what we can do with each other, for each other, tonight is your answer. Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews, the show that brings you in-depth analysis on the topics facing municipalities across Canada. Today, we delve into Monday's Toronto mayoral by-election, which has the political class from all corners of this great country talking. The former Toronto Board of Education trustee, former councillor for Toronto, and former member of Parliament of Canada, Olivia Chow, was elected as Toronto's next mayor Monday night. Chow now becomes the 66th person to hold this office. The by-election was set off after former Mayor John Tory resigned his seat after admitting to an extramarital affair with a city staffer. Joining us is a distinguished guest who knows the newly elected mayor quite well, a former colleague and fellow advocate for the people, former member of parliament for Scarborough Southwest, Dan Harris. Dan, always a pleasure. It's always great to be here. Thanks for having me on again. So, Dan, let's get the big question out of the way. Olivia Chow, your former colleague in the House of Commons from 2011 to 2015, has been elected Toronto 66th mayor. What was your first initial re reaction to this? Uh, well, it took me a little while to, to get the reaction I was hoping for, uh, because after getting the kids to bed last night, uh, I turned the results on, and uh, lo and behold, she was... 5,000 votes down to Anna Balao. And I thought, oh my God, it's happening again. Uh, and then the very first update that happened flipped it right around. Uh, and suddenly she was 9,000 votes up. And I thought, oh, it's it's going to happen. And I, I'm i over the moon uh, that this is, has happened for uh, very many reasons. Uh, not just that it was uh, Olivia's second crack at it, uh, but municipal politics has always been uh, that family's bailiwick. Uh, that's where Jack Layton and Olivia Chow first uh, met each other, uh, got to know each other, uh, fell in love. Uh, and uh, then, I mean, they were a dynamic duo uh, at City Hall for years and years. Uh, then they moved the show to Parliament, and they were both exceptional advocates uh, for the people, as you said earlier. Uh, and, of course, I mean, Mike Layton followed in Jack's footsteps and became a city councillor. Uh, Olivia tried to run for mayor last time, and her opponents were Doug Ford and John Tory. Uh, so, you know, sometimes things come full circle. Uh, and then uh, she gets elected tonight. And, I mean, it finished with a, a good mandate. She ended up 5% above the second place. And uh, now we get a chance to see uh, what a progressive can do uh, at City Hall again. And we haven't had that since David Miller. And I mean, the David Miller years were good years for Toronto. Uh, they didn't end in the, on the greatest of terms uh, for a few reasons, uh, but a lot got done. And, you know, if only we'd been able to hold on a little longer, we might have gotten Transit City, uh, which would have been transformational for Toronto. And I mean, now Toronto, it's 20 years later, and we're still waiting for most of that transit uh, to come to fruition. Uh, and I think Olivia is the perfect person to push that forward. She, uh, as a member of parliament, was often the transportation critic. Uh, and I mean, she she knows the city inside and out. Uh, from the being a school board trustee up to, to being a councillor for years. And, uh, you know, she founded the Institute for Change Leaders uh, since then. And I mean, she, she is an advocate uh, for the people. Uh, and I mean, you know, they used to live in co-op housing because they believe in it. And uh, I think we're we're going to see see some great things. I think it's none of it's going to happen tomorrow though, uh, because there there's a lot she's got to wade through to get things done. 
Now, I want to talk about uh, Olivia the person, because you've probably got to know her quite well, even prior to being elected and then being elected and serving alongside her. She is going up against a very divided city right now. There is a large uh, conservative, I would say more right-leaning uh, uh, councillors on that council, and then there are a lot of progressives. Does she have the ability to work across party lines and work uh, with all different uh, political ideologies? And in your time working with her, did you see her working with liberals and conservatives or even the Greens? Uh, well, I mean, she like, like I said, she has that City Hall experience already. And uh, that's what City Hall's always been about, is uh, making amends with the people that you don't always agree with to get things done. And, uh, you know, I mean, the budget process is going to be very interesting to see next year. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what changes she makes to the committee structure uh, at City Hall to put in uh, more favorable people to get her agenda moving forward. Um, but I mean, within within the caucus, uh, she was somebody that you could always go to to ask for advice. Uh, and she was never shy on giving it, even if it wasn't what you wanted to hear. And I think we we need that in politicians. Uh, because, you know, today on the, on the news, on the media, every single interview she did was prefaced by tax increases. And I'm sorry, but, you know, we need some tax increases. Nobody of the candidates was saying we're not going to have tax increases. Everyone was saying, well, you know, with, within inflation. Well, what's inflation been in the last couple of years? It's been close to 10%. I, nobody can afford 10% inflation, and Olivia is not going to do that. But she's also not going to sabotage the process. The budget process is you establish what you need, and then you know how much it's going to cost, and then you figure out how to get that money through property tax increases, through uh, other revenue sources, through the province and the federal governments. Uh, whereas all the other candidates were saying, we're going to limit it to this uh, before the process is even started. You don't know how much money you need, so you don't know how much money you're going to be missing. Uh, when you actually put that increase in. Uh, I, so I think... I, I love when people talk about the fact that they're not going to have tax increases, then in the second breath, literally within the second same breath, actually, they say, we're just going to deal with inflation. Well, inflation raises is, is still a tax raise. I don't care who you are. I don't care how you try to spin it. If you increase your taxes, even through inflation, it's still a tax increase. Let's get our head around it, everyone. There's my there's my little TED talk for the day. <laughs> and, you know, we went through this with my last one, uh, who was there before David Miller, where, of course, he promised years of no tax increases when the city got amalgamated. And suddenly you had to find a way to bring six cities services into one. Uh, you know, consolidation does bring some efficiencies, but it costs a lot of money along the way. When you've got two fire stations across the street from each other and you don't need them both, there's a lot of costs in shutting one of those down and expanding the other one uh, in order to make it more efficient. Uh, so, you know, after all those years of malassment and no tax increases, there had to be larger than what we would have liked tax increases uh, to actually uh, start paying for infrastructure, which was crumbling at the time. And I mean, what have we seen over the last uh, decade in Toronto? Uh, it's been austerity. Uh, it hasn't been said to be that way. Uh, but, you know, the city is less safe. We've had cuts in services. There's less things for kids to do. Uh, there's less parks getting cleaned up. Uh, it's been less across the board. And that's that's what you get with those inflationary tax increases. You actually get service cuts. Uh, and Olivia is not going to be bringing service cuts uh, to the table, uh, which is exactly what Toronto needs right now. You talk about the last decade. So we've had John Tory, Rob Ford, David Miller, Mel Lastman. And I think before Mel, and correct me if I'm wrong here, because you're probably a little bit more aware of this, Barbara Hall was before Mel Lastman? Uh, Barbara Hall was before Mel Lastman, but Mel Lastman was the first amalgamation mayor. Amalgamation uh, yes. when the, Yeah. When the, city was, uh, the cities were amalgamated, he was the, the first mayor, and he was there until David Miller came in. There's a lot of things that are going on in Toronto right now, and Olivia has a very big, uh, uh, basically dinner plate full of the issues that are uh, that are facing the uh, city of Toronto. Is she starting ten yards back in a the middle of a mandate that John Tory had just won not even 
less than a year ago? Uh, I, I don't think she's starting 10 yards back, but maybe five yards back. Uh, because as you said, it was less than a year ago. And uh, municipal mandates are now four years. Uh, when I first ran for city council in 2006, they were three-year mandates. And not so long before that, they were two-year mandates. And a while before that, they used to be one year. You used to have to elections every single year. Uh, so now there's still three years to get things done. There's still three municipal budgets. There's three years of working the federal and provincial governments uh, to actually come to the table because Toronto is the economic engine of the country. Wait, we, wait, 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 and, whoa, whoa. Don't say that on an Alberta podcast, man. Come on. <laughs> Joking. Yes, I know. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, Alberta contributes a lot uh, through one single resource, uh, and uh, if anybody knows anything uh, about those markets, they go up and they go down. Toronto is the gift that's been giving Canada more for the last 40 years, um, and what Toronto needs, we don't we don't want to stop. Uh, contributing to the country. But what Toronto has always needed is to get a little bit more back from the provincial and federal governments uh, in order to make sure that we can keep revving that engine so that we can keep contributing to the rest of the country. Uh, and to do that, you know, we need to have world-class transit. We need to have world-class services. The tourism industry in Toronto is huge. Uh, so, you know, we need to make sure that, uh, you know, the AGO, the ROM, the Science Center on, you know, Ontario Place, Ontario <laughs> Place, uh, the islands, uh, the Toronto Zoo, all of those things have the money that they need, uh, and I mean they haven't. Many of them haven't for a long time. The Toronto Zoo had to give up its elephants, one of the biggest attractions, because they couldn't afford a few million dollars to renovate the paddocks to actually make them safe and secure. Uh, and good for the elephants. Uh, and what happened after that? You know, the numbers of people that went to the zoo plummeted. Uh, and that just made the financial situation even harder. Uh, and I mean, I'm very glad that Olivia's dug in on Ontario Place, uh, which I mean, I have so many fond memories of from when I was a child. Uh, and then as a teenager, uh, Legoland was fun too. Uh, but like from uh, as a child going to Ontario Place, and then as a teenager and young adult going to concerts there. Uh, and I mean, the my whole family has been there. It was, you know, my mom, who was, uh, you know, a very, uh, she didn't have much money uh, to spend on things. Ontario Place was the one place she could afford to take us. Uh, because I mean, and I mean, it was provincially, largely provincially funded. Uh, but, you know, it was it was mismanaged for a long time, unfortunately. And, uh, you know, the, the ridership and the numbers uh, plummeted. Uh, and then, you know, the liberals decided to pull the plug, which is ironic because it was actually turning around at that point. And then they just decided to pull the plug. Um, but uh, no, she, she's got some... about something here for a second, because I want to yes. talk about a statement that you talked about a little bit earlier. The six cities, the six cities that amalgamated into the one. Now, I didn't see this until you had actually sent me the data, but I was looking after you sent it to me where Olivia won and where Olivia came in second place because she came in second place in the areas that she didn't win. Um, and now York, Humber River, Black Creek, Eglinton, Lawrence, Don Valley, East, West, and North, and one area in Scarborough went uh, to the second place, Anna Bal Baleo, if I'm pronouncing it. Right. Balao is the Balao. best the best way I've been able to pronounce it. Okay, Anna Balao. And Olivia, the new mayor-elect Chow, won Parkdale High, Davenport, Spad uh, Spadina, Fort York, all the downtown core, and a large portion of Scarborough. Now, as someone who is uh, a former MP for Scarborough, and I think, she, yes, she actually did win your old riding as well, what does this tell you about Toronto today? Does it tell you that more progressives are willing to put their faith in someone who is more NDP-leaning and not go with the traditional center-right candidate that we traditionally see in the Liberals who win in those areas that she traditionally won in? Uh, well, well, there some of it would definitely be that, but this was a change election, uh, I and think I think so. that 
it was a change election. And I think that was uh, the thing that uh, the other campaigns didn't pick up on uh, until late in the game. Uh, and I mean, we will probably end up talking about how important that John Tory uh, endorsement was uh, because it, it really served to coalesce the anti-Chow vote, uh, which up until the last week was split among five different, five or six different candidates. Um, but I mean, there, there's a number of things. There's there's the progressive voices certainly uh, came out uh, because, again, it was a change election because who was the most motivated to come out and change? or sorry, come out and vote, the people who want to change. The people that were good for the status quo were less likely uh, to come out and vote. Uh, and I mean, I, I still haven't seen the advanced polling numbers yet, uh, but I have an inkling that they are, are going to have an oversized influence on the results this time. Uh, because when the advanced polls happened, uh, you know, Olivia was 15 to 20 points ahead of anyone else. And Anna Bailao was not in second place at that point. Uh, there was only one polling firm that had her uh, in second place. All the others had her in third, fourth, or fifth. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think... you have to make connections out in York? Because York is, for those who... Etobicoke and York, because for those who don't know Toronto that well, that is Ford country. That is Rob Ford, Doug Ford, like... That is where he gets elected provincially. That's where he got his the majority of his votes uh, when Rob Ford won his mayoralship in 2014. Does Olivia need to start making connections outside of the downtown core where she did incredibly well, even looking at the first numbers, the unofficial numbers that have already been uh, unofficially released? Uh, well, I mean, she should be wanting to do that anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, one of those words, uh, I think it was the Black Creek one, she actually only lost by two votes. Okay. Um, but also many of those areas are uh, like parts of Scarborough, uh, among the poorest and the most downtrodden areas uh, in the city. Uh, the ones that have uh, way too many police compared to other services. Uh, and I mean, we can get into to that discussion later, too, if we want to. Uh, it's a complicated one, though. Um, but no, I mean, she should definitely be uh, wanting to make inroads into those areas. Uh, but I, I think the campaign for the election, they identified that Scarborough was a uh, good country for Olivia to campaign in. Um, and when you look at uh, some of the ethnic diversities within Toronto uh, these days, uh, there is uh, a lot more Italian, Portuguese, Greek uh, that's headed out to the West End. They originally settled many of them in the east end of the city, and then they had success, and they went and moved into uh, areas that were uh, more economically viable and sound for them. They had bigger houses, things like that, uh, so they were able to move out to the west side. Um, and in Scarborough, you have by far the largest contingents of a Chinese community uh, that exists in Toronto. Uh, you can't go a block without seeing signs with it with you know Chinese writing on them uh whether it's Mandarin Cantonese or or other dialects um and so I'm shocked I, that she took Scarborough then because I'm be I'm honest, not shocked I'm pleasantly am, surprised but I'm not shocked I was shocked um, I thought Mark Saunders would have done better out in that area because Ford Fest was a week before the election in Scarborough I, Exactly. I thought Mark Saunders was going to be the second place, and I did not expect him to do so poorly, to be honest, because I think he barely got 9% of the vote, if that, if like 8% of the vote. Um, I want to talk about that a little bit later as well, but I want to know, from from when you were elected in 2011 to 2015 as the Scarborough MP to today, and I know you don't live in the area anymore, but has it changed so much? I still where... visit many times a year. Exactly. And you have family there as well. And I, I should have said that beforehand. But has it changed over time, like since you uh, were elected to 2023? Um, my The area that I represented has, has always been changing. It hasn't changed that much because it is the most established area of Scarborough. Uh, but where, where you have had even more change is in the outer areas where there has been a lot of development. And I mean, you hear Ford and others talk about the fact that we're not developing things enough. <laughs> there's there's just as many cranes up in the city of Toronto as there has been in the last 30 years. 
And I mean, Toronto has been one of the world leading cities for construction uh, and condo development and things like that. And I mean, it, it slowed down a little bit recently, but I mean, that's a pandemic and interest rates. That's not what's been going on in politics. Uh, so, I mean, there, there have been a lot of people moving and a lot of people moving out, uh, but also the, you could say the gentrification of the city uh, that has been going on apace for a long time. Uh, you know, the people that used to live uh, in, uh, you know, the beaches, let's say, then, you know, they uh, eventually move into the Scarborough Southwest and then they kind of move into Scarborough Center. And uh, of course, new immigrants that are coming to the city because the city still gets a pile of new people every year. Where do they want to go? They want to go where they're going to be able to speak their language, where they're going to be able to see their culture represented. Uh, so those areas have large influx of people. Uh, and I, I think that definitely should have benefited Olivia. Um, and I mean, you know, she's the first racialized uh, um, mayor that Toronto's ever had. She's uh, the, you know, the first woman of amalgamation. Uh, I mean, you did have June Rollins and Barbara Hall before her, but that was downtown Toronto. That's what's now downtown Toronto. Uh, it wasn't the other areas. Uh, and I think there's also in, in those areas, there's, uh, you know, there's always a feeling of being left behind. And Olivia is the person that's always been welcoming to everyone. So we talked earlier on about the full plate that Olivia has to try to fix in Toronto, because there's a lot of issues. And I want to start with the big one that she was talking about a lot during this by-election campaign, housing, 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 housing. Um, affordable housing is key for Toronto's survival, and the province is asking the municipalities, particularly Toronto, do more quickly. Can she get it done? Is a housing a big thing for her? Because I know you talked about how transportation was her sort of pet project in Ottawa, because that's what she knew and that's what she liked to talk about. But is housing a priority for her, do you believe? Uh, housing is absolutely a priority for her. Uh, in the, the area that she used to represent as a, a city councillor, um, back when she was there, uh, there were a lot of mixed-use housing developments that went up. Cooperative housing, affordable uh, units being built. Um, and I mean, that's what's honestly been lacking. You know, the federal government got out of housing in the 90s with, the, with Paul Martin and John Critching. Uh, you know, and when I when I was there as an MP and I actually sat on the special committee uh, looking at cooperatives. Now, that wasn't just housing. That was all types of cooperatives. Uh, that was at a time that the last amount of funding that had been left by the liberals was expiring, uh, which left nothing on the board, uh, which meant that there were going to be no more subsidized units being built. Uh, the liberals have taken an approach to build an affordable housing that I don't think is the right one, uh, but it is getting some stuff built. You could argue it's perhaps not affordable enough, uh, but I mean, Toronto community housing needs a lot of money to fix the units that they have and to build new ones. Uh, and I think that's gonna be a big focus that Olivia is gonna have to have is to actually get big piles of money from the governments to build that housing. If Doug Ford wants a lot of housing built, then you know what, there's ways of doing it. Uh, and it's not by building 600 square foot condos, it's by building apartment buildings that are affordable that can fit families. Um, when, I, when I'd be going door knocking in Scarborough in the apartment buildings, and I'd be going to all the buildings that were built in the 1970s in particular, these things by today's standards are like palaces in terms of the size. You know, there were large living rooms, there were two, three bedrooms in all the units because they were built for families. And that's, that's the part that's been missing out of those high-rise units. Now, you've got the Eglinton Crosstown going across. There's a ton of development going on along that corridor. But right now, it's still all private developers looking to make large profits. Uh, we need to, to be shoehorning a lot of uh, you know uh, mid-level high-rises. Uh, you do need high-rises. Uh, and then, I mean, you, you've... We, we've got to find a way to get a, more cooperative housing in there uh, as well, because, I mean, that's that's a, a, a very sustainable ownership model uh, that gets you mixed mixed housing, where you have people of all income types living in the same areas. Uh, and that's that's the kind of housing that minimizes 
a lot of the safety concerns that people have with low income housing. Um, because you don't get the same sorts of problems that you do when everybody living in a neighborhood is poor. Uh, because that's that's when hopelessness creeps in, uh, and uh, that's when all the other social service costs, including policing, uh, go up. We're going to talk about policing here in about two seconds, but I want to talk about transportation because there has been a lot of talk, and this is just from an outsider's perspective, from a lot of talk saying that, a lot of talk about the state of the TTC. Uh, the state of subways in Toronto. I know that the issue of subways out in uh, Scarborough was a major issue during this last election, uh, during the by-election. Um, and for someone who, uh, like Livia Chow and former NDP leader Jack Layton, who are so passionate about public uh, transportation, but also biking, this seems like it's a win-win for her because when people are wanting better transportation, more public transportation, more ability to get on and get off where they need to, Olivia Chow, this would be like no doubt a big thing for her to try to address in the next three years, right? Um, absolutely. And, and Olivia is very familiar with one of the aspects of transit in the, the inner suburbs and Scarborough in particular uh, that everybody else seems to ignore and certainly the, the Scarborough subway plan uh, ignores it entirely. Um, something most people don't know is that half of all transit uh, rides, transit trips that start in Scarborough actually end in Scarborough. So absolutely you need that that corridor to get people downtown but you need people to have the ability to get around Scarborough. Um, and I mean, during Olivia's failed mayoralty bid, um, you know, people said, well, you know, her transit, her transit plan is boring. It's not sexy. It involves a lot of buses. Well, you know, that's, that's what you have out in Scarborough. You have these wide streets with six lanes and a middle lane for turning. Um, and you have lots of room for buses. Um, and buses are the most inexpensive and quickest transit solution to deploy. Um, and you need to be able to beef that up. But of course, you need the riders to follow. And people are only going to get out of their cars if you can provide a comparable, somewhat comparable uh, experience to their vehicles. Sometimes that means slowing traffic down, unfortunately. Uh, but what you really need to do is speed transit up. And, you know, there has been some success with uh, busway lanes that have been created out in Scarborough. Uh, ironically enough, where the LRT lines were supposed to go. <laughs> um, but you could you can get a lot of buses out there. You can get trips happening more frequently so that people can get to the doctor's office. They can get to their shopping. They can get around Scarborough without having to just go to Scarborough Town Center, that central hub. Uh, and I mean, people in Scarborough are also bracing for seven years of pain, and that's provided no delays uh, for the subway to get to the Scarborough Town Center. Uh, because the Scarborough RT, the rapid transit line, the uh, you know the the monorail line that exists, uh, it is so far beyond repair that it has to be shut down uh, because it's I was becoming. Say, hasn't it shut down? Uh, I'm pretty. It, it it has, and I mean, people are going to be stuck on buses doing those trips for at least the next seven years, um, and that's increased their travel times kind of exponentially. Um, so, I mean, you know, they're getting lots of buses, clearing some roadways, getting people to the subway uh, faster is something that Olivia is going to have to try to implement, but she's going to need money to do that. Um, and We're I mean, uh, talk about working with the province and the federal government yeah. here in a few minutes, but I want to go to my last issue, issue that she has to face, and that is safety. There's been a lot, a lot of media attention about the state of the city of Toronto as of recording this, and that is people not feeling safe, people not wanting to go on the streets. And you talk about policing. There's There was a large, large part of this uh, campaign where some candidates were trying to make it out that Olivia Chow, if elected, would be horrible and make it less safe for people. Um how does Olivia Chow, the next mayor, the well, the mayor elect of the city of Toronto, address safety while keeping the understanding that it's not just a policing issue; it's also a mental health, it's also a social service issue. Uh, well, by by 
focusing on those parts of the issue. All the focusing so far has been on policing. You know, there, there's been talk about, well, you know, when, when people are distressed, we need mental health services to get out there and get, the, get to them. Uh, but what's still happening is police are the first ones that respond. Uh, and, you know, yes, police need better training uh, to be able to defuse these situations. Um, but, you know, they, they've been having increasing, um, you know, sensitivity training and other forms of training, uh, de-escalation training that's been going on for the last 20 plus years. They get the bulk of all the new money that is available, uh, you know, to be able to hire new off more officers, to be able to pay them more. And, you know, I mean, I'm somebody who thinks all workers should be paid well. Uh, especially ones that are putting their their own personal safety on the line. You know, there's hazard pay is a thing and it should be there. Um, but more of the focus has to be on those other things. Unfortunately, those also take time. Um, but I mean, you know, when you're talking about some candidates and I mean, it's, it was Mark Saunders specifically. And I'm sorry, but you know what, Mark? The city got unsafe and less safe on your watch. When you were the police chief, when you were the deputy police chief, uh, you know, and all you've been advocating is more of the bloody same. You know, it hasn't fixed the problem in the last 20 years. And I mean, I'm trying to keep Bill Blair out of the conversation. But of course, I mean, he he's one of my bailiwicks there uh, because, I mean, you know, he was engaged in a lot of it beforehand. Um, but yeah, I mean, he he just wants more of the same. And I mean, you know, he's a cop. He's a cop's cop. Uh, of course, he's going to want all the money to go there. But the, all the money can't go there. Uh, and I mean, you know, it costs so much less to house um, a person who is an unhoused person than it does to put them into a shelter, than it does to put them into a hospital, than it does to incarcerate them. You know, we are talking like exponentially less money to put them into housing. Uh, so that's, again, that's where we need to build the housing so that those unhoused people uh, can increase their quality of life. If they have mental health issues, once they're housed, you know where they are, you can get them the services that they need. You've got to beef up the services too. You know, I mean, we need more childcare in the city. We need more mental health services in the city. We need more of a lot of things. Uh, and I think Olivia is the, the person who's going to push all of those uh, to get the most that we possibly can. John Tory wasn't doing that. You know, I mean, he was the, meh, okay, you know, like, we're going to try to do things. But, you know, Torontonians after the, after Rob Ford, you know, they were quite satisfied for a while with the fact that, you know, Toronto is not the mockery of the world. Uh, we're we're because, not making you know, international news for... We're not uh, on Saturday Night Live every week. We're, you know, we're not the punchline of the late night shows, right? And, I mean, people people were happy with that for a while. Um, so and I, I, I don't want to talk about the Fords here for a second before, because I realized I said a half hour and we're at the half hour mark. So I guarantee you, you got some more time than you have for a few minutes here, but I want to talk about the relationship that Olivia Chow now has to sort of foster between Doug Ford, her former, uh, I would say rival, but, uh, he ran Rob Ford's campaign. He basically gave Rob Ford uh, the win in 2014 against John Tory and Olivia Chow. How does Doug Ford and Olivia Chow's relationship look like in the next three years? Is it going to be combative or because Doug Ford and John Tory were basically BFFs and I saw it and I think everyone else saw it, that they were basically at every other function together, but I don't see Olivia Chow and Doug Ford hanging around with the same people. Would I be wrong? Uh, you would be wrong. They don't. And I mean, you know, John Tory and, and Doug Ford were BFFs. And I think that was in some ways part of the problem because it meant that Ford knew that he could kind of get away with things uh, with John Tory that he wouldn't be able to with someone else. And when I say get away with things, I mean, not doing everything that the city needs. You know, I mean, Doug Ford was able to focus on pretty much everything else as long as John Tory was in the mayor's, mayor's office because John Tory is not going to walk to Queen's Park kicking and screaming uh, to get Toronto more. And he knew that. Olivia Chow will do that if she has to. Uh, but that's, you know, that's not going to be the first option. And I mean, it was incredible uh, to watch the more conciliatory tones from Doug Ford today 
Um, because I think he does know that if things don't go well with the Libya, it could pose him some problems uh, coming up because she took Scarborough. Well, Doug Ford has a number of MPPs in Scarborough who, if they lose in the next election, that's going to give him problems holding on to his majority government. And, uh, and, and, the, and he the, won Don Valley as well. And yeah, not all of them. Some of them went to the or he went to the liberals, but the uh, the like I would imagine Doug Ford is waking up trying to figure out how to be very uh, nice, how to be nice for uh, once in his life to a mayor who may not be uh, sympathetic to his wants or needs. Um, and, you know, I, I think Doug is going to pick his battles. Uh, and I think where the battle will take place is Ontario Place. Um, I, I think Doug will will tone things down and, and not capitulate, but give the city more of what it needs and, and what Olivia is saying the city needs uh, in other areas so that he can hold on to Ontario Place. Uh, for whatever reason, the Conservatives have hung their hat on Ontario Place. Uh, and uh, I mean the Ontario line, certainly, uh, but I don't think they're going to have a fight on the Ontario line that's, that's moving ahead a pace. Um, but I mean, you know, they 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 decided the subway was going to go right down there, uh, and then they they've signed this 99 year deal with Therm. I mean, my God, governments need to stop signing 100 year deals on anything. You do not give away the store, any store, whether it's the 407, whether it's Ontario Place, whether it's a hospital. I don't care what it is. Governments need to stop doing that. That that needs to become illegal. To be honest. Um, because that is just such an abdication of responsibility uh, that just pales. And I mean, you know, they, they've also decided they're going to spend all those millions of dollars building a parking lot. Well, I'm sorry, if Therm has all this, is going to make all this money, why can't they build their own parking lot? They can pave paradise uh, and put up a parking lot themselves, to quote the song. Exactly. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think they're, the big fight is going to happen on that one. And I think you're going to see conciliatory moves. Uh, on a lot of the other files. Uh, but I, you know, and I think transit funding will increase and come forward. Uh, and that's another one where, you know, because cuts were made to transit, uh, now, I mean, the TTC has had to cancel an RFP for new subways uh, because the ridership has dropped so low. Now, we've seen dropped ridership before. You know, we saw it, we, we see it every recession uh, because there's less people going to jobs. Uh, we saw it during the Mel Lastman years when uh, buses uh, were getting cut um, because, you know, if you cut the, the things that feed into the subway, then the whole system suffers. Um, and, you know, that's where I think Olivia is going to beef things up where they can be beefed up. Uh, there's also going to be not a fight, but I think we're going to see movement with Metrolinx and the Eglinton Crosstown. Uh, I think Olivia is going to put their feet to the fire on that. And I think Doug Ford's going to have to uh, rake Metro links across the coals on it uh, to actually get that up and running uh, as the city, the city so desperately needs it. And I mean, it's practically finished. Um, so I, know, I know we talked about Doug Ford here, but I want to talk about the other two elephants in the room, the liberals and the NDP. They've got to be a little bit happy tonight. They are today, like the NDP, uh, probably a little bit more than the liberals, because the liberals are going through this existential crisis right now, trying to figure out who they are and what they want in the party. But if I was... Uh, and there's no Justin Trudeau waiting in the wings provincially. Eh, I would disagree with that, but I think I think that's a conversation you and I can have off the record here. But, I think <laughs> they, um, but if I was the leader of the Ontario NDP today... Would I basically be going to every single event that Olivia Chow was at and making sure that you were standing right beside her? Because the pathway to the premier's chair is through Toronto and the NDP need to pick up all, if not the majority of seats in that city. Do they not? Uh, they, they certainly have to take a lot of them. Uh, and I mean, they, they've got to do it in a way uh, that makes other places see the NDP as viable for government. Mm -hmm. um, that's always one of the NDP's challenges is there's a lot of people that don't vote for the NDP because they don't think we can win. Um, and, you know, we need to see really great polling numbers and we need to see, 
you know, t- Toronto's going to fall to the NDP. There's going to be a sweep in Toronto, or as close to it as 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 can happen, uh, in the polls and things like that prior to the election and during the next provincial election, uh, in order for more seats to start dropping, uh, to you know really get that ball, you know, that rolling down the mountain, uh, and get that avalanche started. Um, but uh, yeah, I. I, I like, think if you were styles, styled, yeah, if you were her today, would you be going basically be like because Doug Ford gave his congratulations, not congratulations press conference that everyone knew that he was going to have to do after the results. But would Merritt Styles basically come out today or tomorrow and hopefully say, can we have a sit down chat between you and I about the future of the city and what you want from a provincial government? Uh, I, I think already. she will. I, I think she, if it hasn't already happened, I think it certainly will be happening. And I think you'll see more coming out of that meeting, uh, you know, in front of the cameras and, and trying to get some press on it. I do not think you are going to see uh, Marit showing up at all of Olivia's events uh, because Marit is currently in the process of establishing herself as the leader. Uh, she's still trying to climb out of uh, Andrea Horvath's shadow. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think Olivia Chow also will want to be tied too closely uh, to the NDP because she is also in a period of trying to open the tent and make the tent bigger uh, because, you know, even among progressive councillors, there's a number of them uh, who did end up supporting Anna Bailao. There's a number of labor unions that supported Anna. Some of that happened before Olivia got in a race. Uh, but some of it still kept happening after because Anna and they knew that that was a place they had to focus to try to get a bunch of that support so that they could deny it to Olivia. Um, and Olivia needs to, because, you know, she does only have three years before the next election and she will presumably want a second term. Uh, so she's going to have to consolidate and solidify what she has and make gains. Uh, and I think she's going to have to reach across to a lot of the, the, you know, the liberal councillors that exist on, on council uh, and bring them into the governing tent uh, because there, there aren't enough New Democrats at council to rule the whole city and to do everything themselves. And they don't have a majority on council. And Olivia, you know, she might have strong mayor powers and, you know, never say never. I think there's a scenario where she may end up feeling forced to use some of them at some point. Uh, but she believes in democracy and she's come out and said that she doesn't want to use them. And she believes in majority rules for the council. Uh, so that means she's going to have to work to get that that group of people together to win those votes uh, in order to to push the things that they need to be pushed. Now, earlier today, Justin Trudeau and Olivia Chow did have a conversation between uh, between the two of them. Uh, Olivia Chow did post a photo of her talking on a phone, um, presumably to Justin Trudeau, because it was a retweet of the prime minister's tweet. Um, I, I recently spoke to someone on the show, and they said that Toronto is basically another province. It is a province, but a city. And the, the, the sixth of, largest government in the country. Exactly. The mayor of Toronto has the personal cell phone number of the prime minister. If the mayor of Toronto calls the prime minister's office, the prime minister answers, whether it be John Tory and uh, Justin Trudeau, David Miller, and probably Stephen Harper, they were able to get in contact with each other. What's their relationship going to be like? Because you've worked with both of them. You saw Justin Trudeau as leader of the <coughs> party. You saw <coughs> Olivia Chow in the House of Commons. Is this going to be a little bit more easier of a relationship than Doug Ford and Olivia Chow? It should be. And it should be <laughs> because uh, I think, and you know, I say this as a new Democrat, and there's parts of it that I don't like, but I think that Olivia Chow might be the thing that could help save Justin Trudeau's government in the next election. Um, because the polling numbers have not been great for the Liberals federally. Um, and uh, the polling around Toronto, although it's it's been solid, uh, there's big cracks in their foundation. And um, if things, if the Liberals don't start accomplishing things, and accomplishing things not just in Toronto, but in the rest of the country, uh, you know, there's a good chance that they'll lose the next election. Um, because people are going to get tired of saying, we've given you a decade, we've given you all these cracks at at it, uh, it's time for somebody else because you just haven't gotten the job done. And Olivia wants to get things done and wants to get things done quickly. The only people that have the money to do that 
is the federal government. The federal government could throw huge amounts of money at transit in Toronto. They could throw huge amounts of money at housing and social services uh, and health care uh, in Toronto. Some of that has to go through the province too, uh, but there's lots of ways around that. Um, so I, I think that, you know, Justin Trudeau could end up getting a lot of things accomplished in Toronto through Olivia Chow. And they'll both take the credit for it. Uh, if, so if Olivia you were a liberal MP her in base. Toronto right now, if you were a liberal MP in Toronto right now, would you be waking up on Tuesday morning when we're recording this, what we're recording Tuesday night? Uh, would you be waking up Tuesday morning thinking, okay, uh, I, I need to get my ha head out of my ass and start actually trying to figure out what's the next steps here? Because if Olivia Chow is taking Scarborough, if Olivia Chow is taking the downtown core, which is a strong liberal stronghold, even during the 2011-2015 era when the NDP swept the majority of the liberal ridings, would I be waking up going, okay, now I need to really reconsider what I've been doing and how I've been advocating for the city of Toronto? If they're smart about it, yes, absolutely. No, I, I, and I, and I say that because. I do not have a lot of faith in liberals. Uh, and they, I, I think by and large, they are terrible at governing. They're great at the performative things. Uh, they are the natural governing party, which gives them a huge leg up all the time. Um, and, you know, the, you know, the NDP isn't where it needs to be to be, uh, really dangerous for the Liberals right now. Uh, but if the Liberals don't start accomplishing things and the NDP starts actually promising to do those things that the Liberals aren't getting done, uh, you know, that sentiment could start to change. And I mean, you know, the Liberals and the NDP have been working relatively well together uh, with the agreement. Uh, but I mean, it's the NDP is pushing the Liberals like, they're in the Liberals' back, pushing them on everything to get things done. Um, you know, from the grocery rebate, um, there's just like dental health. Most care. of the things accomplished, most of the things accomplished in in Parliament in the last year has been because of the NDP. Child care. You know, the Liberals have been promising it forever. It was finally when the NDP got there that it started to finally happen. Um, so, I mean, we're talking child care. We're talking about uh, grocery store rebates. We're talking about fighting inflation. Um, there's one big one that's just escaping my mind at the moment. Dental uh, health care. Dental care. Dental care. Thank you. And I mean, that's that's not done yet. Uh, that's one of the reasons why the NDP can't just threaten to pull out of the deal. Because if we threaten to pull out of the deal and we actually pull out of the deal, uh, then none of the rest of the things happen for dental care. And I mean, it's gone in for kids. It's gone in for seniors. Uh, and it's gone in for teenagers. But the general public, by and large, hasn't seen that yet. Um, so I want to yeah, so I want to get back to Olivia Chow here for a second, and I want to know from your standpoint, and I relatively know the majority of the councillors who sit on Toronto City Council, and I've been trying to figure out over the last about twenty four hours since polls closed, and Olivia Chow was uh, announced that she was one winning. She had uh, been elected as uh, Toronto's next mayor. Who the deputy mayor it would would be? And I've been trying to figure out who in that uh, city council would she want on her side. And the only name that it kept on coming up to me was Josh Matlow. And I don't know the guy that well. I followed his campaign a little bit. But he seems like the sort of quote unquote liberal center right candidate where he would be able to bring those Brad Bradfords, those Paul Ainsley's over to Olivia Chow to get some of these progressive issues on the books? Or is there someone that you could even think of right now? And I know I'm putting you on the spot with this question that you could say, if she chose this person, this counselor, they'd be a formidable team. Uh, no, jo Josh Matlow is a, is a good bet for that. Um, and I think he played a little bit more uh, the, the center right guy in the campaign than probably he should have. Uh, and he did that, you know, because I think he saw that uh, there was a lot of crossover between people who might vote for him and people who would vote for Olivia. 
Um, and as, as a result, he went after Olivia a fair bit. And uh, he would be a good choice for Olivia in terms of team building, in terms of saying, well, you know, I can look past the people who uh, attacked me during the campaign. Uh, and Matt Lowe does, does have uh, a, a good experience. I mean, he had the same start as a school board trustee as Olivia had. And that was during the, the Miller, years, Miller years when all the, the other spots in that area were held by New Democrats. And he was the one liberal that was in there. Um, so, I mean, he would be a, a, a good bet. Um, outside of, you know, like, I, I was mean, even thinking Diane he, Saxon, which is near where I think it's. Spadina York or Spadina Parkdale, where uh, she's elected a Ward 21, if I'm not mistaken, former Green I, Party of Ontario co deputy leader. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's a there's a number of there will be a number of good choices. Um, and I mean, you know, an interesting one could also be Osma Malik, like, you know, to, to bring in another racialized woman and you've got the powerful team there. Uh, and I mean, those two know each other incredibly well and have worked okay. together in the past. Uh, and she would make a, a very good deputy for uh, Olivia as well. Um, you know, just because, you know, so often things kind of go that way, there's a really good chance it's going to be a, a white guy uh, so that you have that, you know, the, the, the visible diversity between the two of them. And there's still a lot of white guys on council. Uh, well, it's definitely not Brad Bradford. Bradford. It's definitely not Brad Bradford. Um, and you know, I, I don't know how she brings him into the fold. Uh, but he certainly recognized that she might become mayor when, uh, he went for that, uh, photo op with her at pride. Um, you know, and there's, there's other folks, uh, that have been around for a long time. If she's looking for somebody in Scarborough, uh, you know, I mean, Councillor Ainsley is somebody who I think they could certainly work together well on. Uh, and for my own part, you know, my own stuff with transit in Scarborough, uh, Councillor Ainsley and I were literally the only politicians in Scarborough that back in the day were opposed to the Scarborough subway and said, we need to be spending that money all over Scarborough, building out the entire transit network. Um, and so, I mean, he could be effective there as well uh, and help her to, to solidify Scarborough. Uh, I think uh, Gary Crawford's days as being the center of attention and budget chair are long done and good riddance. Um, uh, so because I want to, I, I want to pose a, a hypothetical here. Does does she hold on to McKelvey? Maybe you know well, she that's, seems that's to have done a, thinking, a slightly right? competent job in you know as the caretaker during that time, uh, and, and that was the one word she didn't Anna. lose. Yeah. Uh, that was the one word that uh, Olivia didn't win, but she only lost it by 34 votes. Uh, that's incredibly close to sweeping Scarborough. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, she could end up, you know, I think Jennifer, even if I might disagree with a lot of things she did, I think she proved herself as a capable manager. Uh, so that, that could be a good choice for Olivia as well. So I want to pose a hypothetical here. Anna Bellow. She got a late minute, last minute endorsement from John Tory that kind of pushed her into second place. I know polls were starting to see her move up, but I believe that that endorsement from John Tory really did a number for her to get her into that. Even like it almost made her a man. Exactly. Do you think if John Tory would have made that endorsement two weeks earlier, we'd be having a different conversation right now? Uh, I think it's possible. Uh, I know, hypothetically, that, and I know it's a hypothetical. Oh yeah, no, no. I it's I think it I think it's definitely possible because um, while I do, if, if it happened before the advanced polling, and it shot Anna into the clear uh, anti Chow candidate, uh, I think a lot of the people that voted for many of the the folks that finished three to ten uh, might have ended up uh, voting for Anna, uh, and I think it you know it would have brought a lot more attention to Anna's campaign. Uh, and I mean, she already had no problems getting in the media and getting every year, like all the attention that she needed. Um, but I definitely think it, it, it would have shot things up. And I think it would have had more impact uh, on uh, Jennifer McKelsey's endorsement of her as well. Um, I mean, that definitely happened before Tory, but man, can people just stop saying they're not going to get involved and then get involved when things aren't going your way? 
speaking you of know, someone who didn't who didn't want to get involved, but then at the last minute also made an endorsement that fizzled like there was no tomorrow. Doug Ford's back candidate, Mark Saunders, failed. Like this is a is this not a resounding like statement that maybe Doug Ford needs to look at what's going on in Toronto and I, I it's a resounding statement that Ford has interfered too much in <laughs> Toronto since he became premier. You know, I mean, let, let's not forget, right after getting elected, you know, when the last municipal, like two municipal elections ago, the election was already on, candidates had already filed, people were campaigning, and he came out and eliminated half of the wards in the city. Um, you know, cut council in half during an election. Um, you know, and I mean, like my riding, we had two, we used to have two city councillors. Now we have one. And I mean, that there was a like in the downtown, of course, it meant that in a lot of cases you had two new Democrats having to face off against each other. Uh, but in, in the inner suburbs, you ended up sometimes having two conservatives facing off, sometimes two liberals, sometimes a liberal and conservative. Uh, you know, it kicked a lot of people uh, out of government and it made exist the, the folks that won, uh, it made their jobs a lot harder. Uh, now, I think it did have its intended uh, results uh, in some cases where it burnt a lot of councillors out. Um, if that hadn't have happened, I'm not sure that Mike Layton uh, would have left when he did. Uh, and I'm not sure some others would have, uh, you know, not run for re-election. Anna Balao might have run for re-election last term, if not for the fact that she had double the wards uh, and double the issues to deal with. Because... You know, when you're dealing with developers and development requests uh, and those zoning issues, out in Scarborough, uh, you know, you're you're dealing with a handful comparatively. When you're in downtown Toronto, you are dealing with hundreds of them a year. And when you suddenly have double the physical space, then you're dealing with double the number of them. Uh, and that is exhausting, and it's exhausting, painstaking work to try to get all the things you need for the community out of those developers in those new projects and make sure they're an actual value add. Um, and it takes so much time away from constituents, uh, from talking to the people and finding out what they need. Uh, so I think that it did have some of the intended uh, results. Um, but over time, uh, as the city grows, if the city keeps, uh, you know, that downtown progressive core keeps expanding, uh, then I think in the long term it might hurt conservatives and it might push them out of the city, uh, which is not a good thing for conservatives uh, in the in the province and in the country. Olivia Chow accomplished something that her husband wasn't able to do in 1991, which has become the mayor of Toronto. Yet again, the city of Toronto and the uh, metropolitan of Toronto are two different things. You knew Jack Layton, you knew Olivia Chow. Their relationship was very much a team effort. Their work was a team effort. Jack's got to be looking down right now, just grinning ear to ear, right? Uh, I tweeted out last night that uh, Jack was crying tears of joy um, at seeing Olivia succeed. They were such an incredible team together. Um, and he supported her as much as she supported him. Uh, and I think, you know, he he could not be happier with uh, what happened. And I mean, I'm trying to keep myself from crying. Um, because, yeah, I mean, I, I knew them since I was a teenager. You know, the first time I uh, was in their backyard for a political event was uh, when I was 16 years old. Uh, and I mean, when Jack was running for the leadership and, you know, there's, I, I had many good times uh, in and around their home and it was always so welcoming. And, uh, you know, Olivia's mom was always around, uh, you know, doing things and making things for us. And I saw somebody tweeting about uh, today about how she uh, was on the picket line at the Delta Hotel uh, many, many moons to go. And, um, you know. They're all smiling at Olivia tonight. They certainly are. So I want to end on this. We've talked about Olivia. We've talked about the city of Toronto. We talked about the relationships that she has to build, the issues. 
But I want to talk about the man that she has replaced, John Tory, for one 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 question. Then I'm going to do my wrap up here, Dan. <laughs> What is John Tory's legacy that he leaves behind in the city of Toronto? Because Olivia Chow was about to make her own mark. Rob Ford made his mark as a very wild card mayor, as someone who you you you, you expected to see in the media every night. David Miller made his about being the clean Toronto, about being the transit hub. What is John Tory's legacy that he leaves for Toronto? Uh I, I think, unfortunately for John, it's not going to be uh, a great positive legacy. Uh, and some of that has to do with the way in which he exited office. Uh, when you, you exit in scandal and uh, in disrepute, like, that's never a good thing for your legacy. Um, and I mean, you know, he, he said he was going to go after two terms and then he didn't. And I mean, I, I, I've seen some postings that were saying that, like, he was well aware that the affair was likely to come out if he ran again. Uh, so I, you know, I I think a good part of his legacy is going to be the fact that he brought us Olivia Chow. Uh, and I don't think that's going to be the legacy that he would want. Uh, but if Olivia succeeds, that's actually a pretty good legacy. If Olivia succeeds. Um, but it's not the one that he wanted. I mean, he brought stability to the city. That's about the only thing I think you can really draw to. Because what improved in the city during his time? Uh, what major change? And, you know, the 401 was always under construction. <laughs> well, but here, here's another one. Like He stayed on the board at Rogers while he was mayor. And then how many times did he make decisions that seem to be decisions for Rogers. Conflict of interest um, written all over it. Then. Yes. You know, like, he's the corporate guy, and, you know, the corporate guy that seemed to not know when to keep his hands and other things out of where they should be. Um, you know, I don't I don't think he's going to have a positive legacy. I, you know, and, I, and I'm not saying that because I'm – you know, a partisan get lined up against him. I'm trying to look for the silver lining here. I'm trying to look for what city building thing did he do? Well, you know, maybe it'll be the fact that the Scarborough subway is happening. But, you know, on, for instance, on the Gardner, you know, Olivia, I think, is going to be able to flip that and get that torn down and save a billion dollars doing it. Yeah. You know, there's one, there's a billion out of the one and a half billion dollar shortfall that the city has right now. You know, 90, like almost, I think, 90% of the capital, you know, roads budget uh, for the city was going into fixing the gardener and into to replacing it with what John Tory had pushed. Uh, you know, that could have been a legacy for him, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, so I, I don't think he's going to have a great legacy. Uh, you know, may, maybe it'll be that pandemic time with his hair. <laughs> Um, I want to end on this question because I hate ending on someone that we're not talking about <laughs> globally, but Olivia Chow, is she up for the job? Absolutely. Uh, 110% Olivia is a fighter. I have never, I have never seen her take her foot off the gas. Uh, she has been going harder uh, than nearly every but other person in politics that I know uh, for a lot longer than people tend to be involved in politics. Uh, you know, I mean, she, she's she been going hard since the 1980s. Uh, you know, practically my entire life, uh, <laughs> she's been pushing hard. And, you know, if you were to go back and I, I saw uh, the news showing some clips of her when she was a school board trustee and some of the things she was saying, about acceptance and about being a place where everyone, uh, you know, where everyone is accepted, where everyone can find their place. Uh, you know, a lot of the messages she had back then are the same ones she was relaying um, on Monday night. And I think that she's now in a position uh, to actually make a lot of those things happen. Uh, because, you know, we were always in the minority we weren't in control of a lot of the levers of power 
Um, and, you know, I mean, during David Miller's time, until until Olivia became the, the federal MP, uh, you know, some things were, were definitely happening. And I think she will get a lot done. Uh, I think it all depends on how many roadblocks some of the other levels put up. Uh, because, again, Justin Trudeau might say all the right things and then put roadblocks up to make sure that she doesn't succeed because he thinks that's beneficial to liberals. Now, I mean, let's not forget, Kathleen Wynne put Doug Ford into the premier's office because she thought that was good for liberals rather than having Andrew Horvath. Um, you know, politics does weird things at times. Um, and, you know, that could happen, but he could also see his uh, his party's salvation in her accomplishing things uh, and taking that away from the New Democrats, right? Liberals do love taking things and taking credit away from New Democrats uh, when New Democrats get things done. Uh, so he could Didn't take that. Approach. Universal health care is all because of Lester Pearson. Tommy who? I don't know who Tommy Douglas is. What are you talking about? Exactly. Right. I'm joking for those um, who are about to send me very strongly worded emails. <laughs> I'm joking. Just I'm like, just about. like, just like, just like employment insurance, uh, just like pensions, all of those things, because the liberals were in government. They're the only ones that did it. What had nothing to do with the new Democrats. They were going to toss them out of office. It had nothing to do with 40 years uh, or 30 years, 25 years of, uh, you know, balanced budgets uh, by Tommy Douglas and, you know, literally transforming Saskatchewan, uh, electrifying it, bringing paved roads, uh, getting rid of outhouses across the province, you know, indoor plumbing, it's its not sexy, but when uh, you never had it before and you get it, it's pretty exciting. It's uh, And I think Olivia is going to bring uh, a lot of infrastructure and a lot of work uh, that is desperately needed. Not all of it is going to be sexy, but people are going to appreciate it. They certainly will. Dan, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's it's great this time to actually be on a positive and talking about something great that's happened. Uh, the last couple of times, we're on, I'm always happy to talk about anything. Uh, but, you right. know, I mean, the you last time I was on... Right, man. Last time I was on was after the Quebec election. It's like, oh, great. That CAC won again. Yippee. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in for being part of this conversation. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. And now if you're able to, please consider backing the show and help us continue to grow and produce more high quality content. We're about to hit out on our cross country tour, sitting down with local elected leaders from all across Canada in their communities. So you will not want to miss that. Uh, if you can support our show, a link to the support page on the Cross Border Interviews website is in the show notes. And finally, as much as we love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and go have a conversation with somebody, even if it's just for five minutes. So with that, thank you again for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. Until next time, remember, just keep talking. And... <music>